Hello, everyone. Is the mic on? Everything good? Cool. Hello. So, Hello. <laughs> thank you for joining uh, today's session. Um, so, basically, just to start with a quick introduction. My name is Tato. I work for uh, as an account manager in Penny, and today we're joined by Barrys from uh, King from Performance Marketing Team. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, kind of start with uh, introductions, I guess. So, as a starting point. Um, could you just give us a bit of introduction? How did you get into the mobile marketing space and uh, mobile gaming to begin with? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, my adventure started 10 years ago. I started working in Procter & Gamble. I worked there for four years in brand marketing. It took me four years to understand that what I'm doing there was something that I don't like to do. So we were giving all <laughs> decisions based on just gut feeling and focus groups. For those of you who don't know what focus group is, you just gather six people in one room and assume that they tell you the truth and they tell you the representation of the big community that you're targeting at the moment, not the case. So, and then all our decisions, like we were taking it, we were giving some marketing decisions, airing our te television commercials. However, at the end, we were not getting any results. So you're doing something, but you don't know what you're doing, and nobody's telling you whether it helped or whether it didn't help. And at the end of four years, I said that this is not something I enjoyed. It could be good for somebody else, but not for me. So yeah. that's when I decided to quit. And I started my own company, and that's where I realized the performance marketing is the perfect thing. It's like a heaven for me. And you have the data, tons of data. You give your decisions based on data, and the same day, you can get the results. And when giving it the more thought, I said the mobile gaming with all the engaged users and amazing uh, environment for that enables more competition inside and much more data points is the best place that, where I can do performance marketing. It's still the case by luck, so that's how I started performance marketing and mobile gaming, basically. Great, great. And uh, about two years ago, you had a you know, big transition of uh, peak games into King. Yeah. Did that prove to be challenging or was like a natural transition for you? Well, uh, two years ago, I think what we achieved in peak games was something amazing. And it was great. We built a lot of structures and kind of written the way how to do performance marketing. Mm -hmm. But eventually, at the end, it was it was a structure that we built and it started to become more stable. And I like challenge and I want to get just a bigger challenge and what else could be a bigger challenge than Candy Crush Saga, which is now a six years old game, yeah. still having the highest revenue in the United States and still played by a massive number of people. And the whole portfolio around it, managing this was the biggest challenge I wanted to take and work together with uh, the great teams of remarketing and cross promotion and TV and brand marketing at the same time. So I took that challenge, and which has turned out to be great, and it's still doing great stuff. That's great, great. And just to touch on the, the industry, you're obviously very passionate about the industry, and your career has led you to work at Peak, at King. Um, so how much has changed from the, from the early days, and uh, you know, how different it is today? Sure, so a lot has changed. Something changed and come back. So back three years ago, what we were doing was just optimizing based on retention. And we thought that it was something sophisticated back then. Then the ROI has been introduced, but it wasn't enough. Then the ROI forecast has become much more sophisticated. We started to use more events and everything. Now the machine learning goes entered into the zone. And the, all the forecasts and bidding structures and optimizations are done at a much more granular level. And then the networks, like Facebook and Google used to be one of the biggest ones, then ad networks uh, start to take much more uh, weight in our install uh, percentage. There was a time where Facebook introduced event optimizations, which uh, turned out to be much uh, massive impact on our business. Google introduced UAC, went down significantly down in terms of spend, then they make it work, it turned up again. Creatives were just something that everybody was focusing on doing the best, most uh, fancy creative ever. Then we introduced the simple gameplay, which the creative guy didn't like at the beginning, but mm -hmm. then it's a performance market, right? We need to find the creative with the best performance. Yep. So it changed the market significantly. Then there was a time where playbooks was massive, then they went down, now it's becoming a trend again. So it keeps changing, like, I think it's changing every kind of six months. Go back to what we believe and just test it again, whether it's the right thing to do or not. And whoever is better in adapting to new market standards, new, uh, new best-in-class performance marketing uh, structures will stay in the market and I think the others will keep losing. Yeah, it's definitely a very dynamic industry. Yeah. So obviously, um, you know, King has been a paying customer for a while now, but just to touch on like, 
what role does data play in your decision making and uh, you know, how, how important it is for you? Well, I think it's, I can come to say that it's everything. Like we don't give any decision based on data. If you want to give a decision and we don't have the relevant data for it, we just throw in a hypothesis, do an A-B test and just get the data, then we give the decision based on it. So seriously, we do not give any decision without <laughs> any data at all. And how, how challenging do you think it would be to operate without data? Well, <laughs> for me, it will be going back to brand marketing here, so I mm. wouldn't like it. So, of course, it will be tough. Uh, we won't have any initial learnings from the market. We'll have to test each and everything. We at least have internal data, but not marketing size. Uh, it will be just creating and finding out, like, conquering the world from scratch. And if you don't have the internal data, it would just mean that we're giving this is based on our gut feeling where sophisticated marketing uh, procedures and everything will not be used. So everything mm -hmm. will be at the same level. And yeah, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> and would you, would you be able to give us like maybe one example of how King is leveraging data in the decision making? Sure, so uh, I'll give an example about the performance marketing side. Yep. What we do day to day is, of course we launch a lot of campaigns, right? But what we tend to do is just maintain them by optimizing them on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the companies out there which are getting the revenue from in-app purchase focus on ROI optimizations, basically. So how we use data is starts with ROI. So in order to create ROI, every company has their own methodology of uh, calculating the forecast ROI. We have our own methodology. So we use all the data we can mm -hmm. from the first action that the user takes in the game until like they complete their lifetime value to understand how they behave and to just try to calculate lifetime value as early as possible. This is how we decide our bidding based on. Mm -hmm. And then the count portfolio management, they're all based on data, of course. Uh, in, our, in terms of countries, we track the marketing size, like whether there's a new trend in the company, a new carrier, a decrease or increase in price and everything. Then go to our portfolio strategy. We try to make sure that every game has its own uh, market and some games could be better in some countries, some games could be uh, worse in other countries. And then creative, that needs a lot of uh, data driven decisions as well. Mm -hmm. All our creative decisions are based on data. Like we don't, we almost never focus on doing fancy creatives. Yeah. Of course we have a branding structure because mm -hmm. Candy Christ again known by a lot of people so we have to stick to some structures but apart from that, uh, all our future creative productions are based on what we have tested in the past, what worked better, what is not working better. Also our competitors, what they're uh, seeing in uh, better results in terms of what kind of creative and et cetera. We also try to consider the industry as well, start from FMCG, telecommunication, try to get an understanding of all kind of uh, user habits and what they mm -hmm. tend to like more uh, recently. So again, in creatives as well, yeah. everything is based on purely data. and Very data driven. <laughs> I mean, yeah, um, cool. So just to touch on the on the kind of expand on the data side, but we recently had a really nice blog post uh, with King uh, from uh, done with the uh, Ishai from the experimental team and uh, how he kind of works. Uh, you know how this team is working to drive the creativity within uh, within King and uh, um, how do you guys actually how does performance marketing work with uh, the experimental team within the King? Sure. So let me give brief introduction. Team. So mm -hmm. this team is working with the product team. They're trying to find out new areas where we can focus for the future product developments, right? Mm -hmm. So there is, as you all know, a new trend of mixed genres. So it's not only puzzle anymore. It's just a combination of puzzle and resource management or mid-core and puzzle and a lot of uh, other mix. So this team is trying to find out uh, new experiments and what kind of new genres are users more interested into. Mm -hmm. And they build a model using a penis cross app usage data mm -hmm. to understand if a person is using puzzle, what else, what kind of other games are they using. And how we leverage that in performance marketing is basically I can summarize it in two ways. One way is by using cross app in, uh, usage data, we try to understand what other apps are our users playing so that uh, in ad networks we can directly target these apps and assume that the initial result will be better than other apps because we'll have higher retention and higher conversion rate, etc. The second way is when we can, like uh, with channels like Facebook, to create uh, interest targetings. When we target these, like the users who are interested in 
the publishers, which have a higher cross-app usage with our games, mm -hmm. which tend to perform better than just any kind of broad title. So we have seen significant impact by that, and we are trying to you know, work together with the experimentation team to understand what further we can do by using this data. That's great to hear. Um, and obviously, uh, how could we skip this? Uh, probably the biggest event for King in 2018 was the launch of the Candy Crush Friends Saga. Yeah. Um, how do you guys prepare for such a big release and how much data do you guys crunch on to you know, prepare this release? Well, it was a massive preparation for us. I yeah. can confidently say that it has been the biggest, uh, widest scale preparation that we have done mm -hmm. uh, in the past. So it was massive because the scale we want to reach on our vision was uh, great and huge. And at the same time, we want to keep our portfolio running in a successful uh, way as well. So what we do differently than other companies is that we have Candy Crush Saga, which is great, and our ambition has never been to kill it and to bring a better game that will perform better. Our ambition has always been to perform as a whole king and make sure that we might the total company. Mm -hmm. And having said that, the preparation needs to include all the uh, side effects as well. Like we need to consider which game will be uh, focused in end market, in platform and network, in publishing and etc. So we have a list of uh, bits at country level, platform level, network level, publisher level. Not only for Candy Crush France, but we have to get, pre get ready for other titles as well. Like, are we going to decrease other titles? Uh, when I say title games, mm -hmm. other games, uh, bits, are we going to keep increasing them? We had some campaigns focusing on positive targeting. We had to do some negative targeting to you know, prevent some other titles. This is how we calculated the get ready for the country uh, mm -hmm. and publisher and network mix. At the same time, we had a great preparation at, on site as well. I think we produced almost 1,000 creatives just before the launch, so we, had, we can ensure that we have the best uh, creativeness to go out there. It performed really great, and luckily we're in a position where we uh, have the, one of the most successful launches in the recent history. Yeah. And yeah, I think yeah, that worked number. out really great until now. Yeah, definitely cracked number one positions in many markets. Um, so before the launch comes out, you obviously prepare with a soft launch. So what are, what are those KPIs that you guys are monitoring uh, at the soft launch st stage? And do those KPIs change after the launch? And do you move on to other metrics? So the initial KPI we want, and our product team is aiming mm -hmm. to achieve is retention. So we want the game to be good enough so that our users will stick to it. They love it. They will play it. If you don't have a good retention, game with a good retention, we don't launch it, basically. Uh, the second thing is the years is not, like 2018 hasn't been a year where you can just grow by virality as five years ago. So we have to do marketing. Like the game has to be marketable. And in yeah. order to calculate marketability, we basically check two things. One is the monetization of the game, whether the monetization is enough for us to outbid our competitors or at least be competitive against them. The second thing is the creative performance, whether our creative conversion rates that we have been uh, producing even before the soft launch is competent enough. Mm -hmm. And this is for the soft launch. If we tick all the three criterias, uh, of course, we have some thresholds that are calculated based on the previous performances and experiences. If we tick all retention and monetization and the creative conversion boxes, then we go to hard launch phase. Mm -hmm. In the hard launch phase, honestly, like the metrics we are tracking is almost the same. It's not different, but of course, the uh, so when during the soft launch, you first target a golden cohort, which tend to perform slightly better in terms of the creative performance and might be monetization as well. Mm -hmm. And in hard launch, we have more longer term targets, which we try to achieve and make sure that the game is marketable. Of course, we have a longer uh, cohort that we can have more reliable results mm -hmm. and to lifetime value curves. Yeah. As most of the payback periods for the in-app purchase uh, games right now is more than six months, on average one year, I would say. And this needs a lot of data points and a long-term maturity to understand the numbers. This is, I guess, the only change that we track between hard launch and soft launch. Cool. And, um, well, obviously, it's king and everyone is expecting uh, that with the, any new game that you come out, you'll be successful straight away. But how much, how much more difficult it is nowadays to be successful and hit those high numbers than it was, I don't know, five years ago, let's say? Well, uh, it's pretty more difficult, actually. 
So I want to answer that in two different aspects. One is the download list. Mm -hmm. So I think in the downloads, it's as a game which is, Candy Crush is not niche. I mean, it used to be one of the mass games, but now you have hyper casuals, which also uh, started to uh, get interest from age and all gender. So I can say that they're even more mass. And with these games, with higher creative and uh, conversion rates significantly, I think for a game like uh, Candy Crush France Saga, it's much more difficult to be number one. Mm -hmm. You have to do much more sophisticated preparation and ensure uh, that you have enough payback periods, you have enough financials to afford that, ensure that your monetization is good enough. Mm -hmm. and that's how you can make the top of the download list. However, for us, the download is not that important. For us, the main important list is the grossing list because that's how we make money, right? And in order to make it top to the grossing list is even more difficult. One, because the old games are there and the churn yeah. rates are really small. Like, the product teams are optimizing them so frequently mm -hmm. that they're doing a great job. They're not uh, enabling the user churn. And we keep doing performance marketing for the old games as well. So it's difficult to take them down. So you have to do something better and better to go out there. Is it impossible? I don't think so. I mean, we can see that Brawl Stars make it to the top 10, which have a very recent line. So it's still possible. Yeah. But you need to do something different than what the previous uh, products are doing. Mm -hmm. And another example is matching the mansion. Like they didn't do a difference in the product, but they found a creative out of nowhere, which nobody believed that conversion race, and they're doing pretty great in the grossing list. Um, so just uh, you touched on hyper casual, but just touch on industry in general. Obviously, like uh, we saw big trends in 2018, such as obviously battle royale crab, uh, games becoming really popular, and the hyper casual is yeah. definitely um, being one of the top performers in terms of downloads. Um, so what, what, what's, what's your outlook? What do you think is going to happen in 2019 and moving on? So in 2019, I think the biggest question is whether hyper casuals will keep growing yeah. or shrink. For me, the companies who are focusing on hyper casuals right now, I believe they will grow, but I, I'm not sure whether we'll keep their games hyper casual anymore because we already started that their new game launch includes more levels. These levels are not optimized as well. But still, I believe they will keep leveraging the higher conversion, creative conversion rates from the hyper casual visuals, visuals. But they will introduce more tools, such as level based optimization and uh, similar tools, to increase the lifetime values to be more competitive in the market. So I think there will be a giant hyper casual and casual somewhere in between that. So, and a lot of companies announced that they will start to give uh, user level ad revenue data. Mm -hmm which will give much more data points to companies like Voodoo. And they will be able to increase their sophistication and increase with the increased lifetime value. I think we'll be competing in what we target as well. Because at the moment, the publishers we are getting installs from are almost mutually exclusive than what the hyper casual companies are targeting yet. So they will just intervene and mix uh, genres entering into each other. It will be a massive competition. On the other side, the creative side is changing significantly. Mm -hmm. I think the interactive ads will start to get more and more uh, in moment. And machine learning, I believe, is one of the things that we'll be focusing on a lot in terms of how we do UA. Yep. And yeah, I mean, will there be another Fortnite? That's a <laughs> very difficult question, but yeah. maybe. Like, a lot of people are working on that, and nobody was expecting the Fortnite to be one of the biggest grossing titles. I mean, everybody was expecting it to be big, but we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Um, and from a penny side, really, um, obviously, you're trying to deliver different products. But what's 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 the missing data metric that you would like to see, or missing product you would like to see from companies like a penny that will help you uh, sure. better? So uh, thanks for having a penny, by the way. <laughs> Without it, it would be really uh, very difficult for us to do marketing. I think the biggest side is since the hyper casual market is leading yeah. kind of the ad revenue games, yeah. like. There is companies out there who are doing great, great number of revenues, mm -hmm. and we are stick to the grossing list where we see the in-app purchases. So I think the biggest uh, request from us will be just having kind of a forecast for what kind of ad revenues are there in the market, and having a grossing list based on the sum of ad revenue and in-app purchases revenue together. And as you know, King already started to show ads like the hyper casual started to include in-app purchase as well. It's just, it won't be ads and in-app purchase totally separated. Yeah. In, in 2019, it will be just a combination of both. We'll start optimizing by the combination of both, so it mm -hmm. would be good to 
uh, get a perspective of how the market is evolving in that side as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you very much uh, for the conversation. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you. You mentioned at King you do a lot of measuring your creative performance. What is the important metric that you use to know which creative is best? So we, before everything, we tend to do relevant creatives, right? Uh, we're not doing any relevant creatives. But still, one of the metrics we are using is retention as a side metric. However, the main metric is still uh, conversion ratio or ITI or whatever you call it, basically install divided by impression. So uh, since a lot of ad networks tend to do different kind of end cards, we almost dropped the CTR out of the calculation because the click numbers change based on who is doing what. So that's a separate calculation that we are trying to ensure that we have the right CTR numbers. However, the main ratio we are looking at is install to impression ratio. And as long as it's good, and as long as that creative do not give us significantly lower retention, we tend to focus on that creative. There is a question whether the creative is impacting monetization or not. And everybody has different opinions about that. Our own calculations and our analysis show that the ratio where it impacts the monetization is statistically significant after around 60,000 installs, which is something that we cannot wait. Like we have to optimize every day. So we tend to think that it's not really impacting monetization, but it really impacts the retention so that we, have a, we need to keep an eye on every time. Hi there, thanks for that. Um, my question is, uh, if data drives everything, data drives all the decisions you make if you don't have it, you A-B test. Um, but there are some uh, channels that will expose more data than others. Um, I guess uh, some of them require long optimization uh, cycles um, and don't necessarily expose a lot in terms of your breakdowns uh, of your data. How do you guys navigate around that? I guess Google UAC is, is an example. How do you guys navigate around that? Do you use your internal BI or is there some other way? So we tend not to work with channels than data with us. And we have to get all the publisher names and everything, like all the data should be uh, visible so for us to be able to optimize. However, Google is a separate case. They're big, like you cannot reject them. Of course, we don't like UAC. It's a black box that we cannot use our sophistication and be better. And we, despite the fact that they're doing pretty good, so we have to work with them. But if we keep Google aside, all the other networks we are working with have the data with us. And the data we can get from Facebook is much more wider and, uh, than all the networks. That what it changed in our life is we are able to give more data to our machine learning system. That's why we can get better results from Facebook, but that doesn't stop us to get similar results from ad networks as well. Because the additional data we are getting is basically the demographic information, which is, of course, that has an impact on the monetization but the impact is not more than 10%. So what we are losing in terms of scales, they're not really massive. Does that answer the question? Yeah, sure. So the, the impact of the, the data or the opaqueness of it isn't too problematic for you for, like, for the likes of Google UAC? Is that what you're saying? Sorry, could you repeat that? So the, the lack of data for Google UAC in this case is not necessarily impacting the performance too much. You're still able to... Well, I assume... I mean, I believe that we could do better yeah. if the data was there for us to play with. But it's not. We have been uh, in touch with Google product team for a while right now, trying to you know, convince them to share the data with us. Mm. It will be possible in recent future. And I'm afraid there are other networks who might turn back on that as well. We still have tools to optimize that. Like the events that we are using for Google UAC is changing. The periods, like the attribution windows we are using is changing. So we can change few stuff. And this is still how we are optimizing things. But to be honest, I can say that the level of sophistication optimization we do with Google is less than the others, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you for that.